a week ago, everybody's here. We'll go ahead and dive in. And uh, our folks that come in on Zoom may or may not come in. Mimi's traveling, I know. So uh, one thing's going to switch next week. We're going to roll back the clock 10 minutes and start at 920 beginning next week. We wanted to make sure I would have done it this week, except didn't have a chance to warn you. So we've been getting a little pressed and pressured for time. So because we've had to end early to get the computer back in the church. So uh, so 920, we're going to give that a shot starting next week. So uh, fall back 10 minutes. Um, is it the weekend too for the clock or that's, no, no. that's later in October? They, they keep first, first week in November. November now. Yeah, it's November now. That's right. Thank you, Abby. Well, good to see everyone today. We've got uh, kind of the third slow down chapter I wanted to do. Uh, we took a little extra time in the past two weeks to look at the Gospels and the historical background to Jesus outside the Gospels. Today, we're going to do the same thing with the early church, and then we'll be cranking through the book a little bit faster and covering a little more territory. But this will be our third of three uh, looks at kind of the, the New Testament period of the church's history, because it's worth slowing down for. This book is written for college students, and there are separate classes for New Testament, Old Testament, all that. So I'm sure they figured right through it, but it was a little fast for my taste. So we're going to slow down today. So New Testament church is the uh, topic today. And again, I'll put this up one more time. I won't put this up every week, but Shirley Rawlinson, you may recognize her when they come uh, from Clovis. Uh, her husband has red hair and a beard. Uh, Shirley teaches at Eastern New Mexico in Clovis. And uh, she also is teaching a college class at ENMU based on this book. And so she has shared her resources with us. So there's a website uh, link there on her website, and she's got lots of interesting stuff. In fact, I was doing a Google search just on Google Images for maps, and I'm not using Shirley's map, but one of Shirley's maps came up in Google Images uh, for the fourth or fifth century. So uh, that, that tells you she's got lots of good stuff out there. And, if, if you want to go to primary documents, she has links to a lot of primary documents. And if you want to read more deeply about Tacitus or Pliny, we'll talk about Pliny next week, I think. Uh, Shirley's got great resources. So drshirley.org slash relg330 slash notes.html. So uh, I'd recommend that. All right, we've, we've been talking about the Gospels, and we talked uh, about them in archaeology not having a big archaeological footprint. They, the Gospels haven't left a lot of artifacts. We talked last week about one solid artifact, a, a tablet with Pontius Pilate's name on it, and that's about it. There are two bone boxes uh, that we've also dug up recently, uh, one in Jimmy's lifetime, one just a few years before Jimmy was born, so recently, uh, as things go. Uh, one may be belonging to Caiaphas, the high priest. Probably, probably, perhaps, probably. Uh, there's another one that belongs to a James, brother of Jesus, uh, son of Joseph. And there's a lot of question about whether that's a fake, whether it's a forgery. It's an old box, but whether they scratched in the inscription later and then tried to make it look older, uh, who knows. But that could be, it could be. Uh, jury's still out on that one. But the Gospels, by and large, don't leave much of, a, of an archaeological footprint. There aren't a lot of artifacts left in the archaeological record that we found so far. Now, that'll start to change when we get to the book of Acts, because as they go out into the Mediterranean world, they mention lots of governors and Caesars, and uh, you know those, those names start popping up. And so there's a lot more archaeological stuff that lines up with the book of Acts and there is that lines up with the Gospels because it covers a much wider chunk of the Roman world instead of just a little tiny sliver uh, way off on one fringe of the Roman Empire. We also talked uh, last couple of times about the literary evidence for Jesus and there's not a lot of it outside of the New Testament. We talked about really being two pages of Josephus. We looked at those in detail last week. Uh, you can check out the YouTube lecture from last week to go through those, plus some references from the early 100s. But really, other than those, and they're not that positive about Jesus, especially uh, Tacitus, I think I put them in again. Uh, really, outside of those, we need the New Testament to find information about the history of the early Christian movement. The, the early Christian movement doesn't really hit the Romans' radar screen until later. And so there, there are not a lot of external documents about the time of Jesus. Having said that, 
Most historians do think Jesus is a real person, uh, that the New Testament is more than sufficient to say he was here historically. You know, whether he's the son of God, whether he was raised from the dead, whether you know, he was born of a virgin, all that stuff. Those are faith statements that we get from the Gospels, and historians uh, either accept, reject, or remain agnostic about those kinds of things. But they do acknowledge that Jesus was a real guy that ran around Palestine, Israel, back in the day. And last week, I, we looked in detail about Tacitus's uh, famous, famous writing here from 116 about those awful Christians. And we talked about uh, the, Crest, the Crestians, as he calls them here. Uh, and the founder was named Christus, and he'd been executed by Tiberius. And in the time of Tiberius by Pontius Pilate, procurator uh, of Judea, he doesn't say that. And it, the superstition erupted not only in the deadly superstition. I love that. Christianity is a deadly superstition erupted not only in Judea, the origin of this evil, but also in our city, the city of Rome, where all things horrible and shameful from everywhere come together and become popular. Uh, you know, crazy Christianity comes just like everything else crazy lands in Rome. Uh, so anyway, uh, Tacitus does, does mention, mention that. Oops, what happened? All right. Oh, I think I had space bars. Well, I'm not sure why I did, Jimmy, but I think I'll try that. All right, so we have to look at the New Testament for history about Jesus. There's just no other, no other way of doing that. And, and ditto for the early church period. Again, though we hit, start to hit the archaeological record a lot more, there are not a lot of external records about Paul, the early church. There are writings later. There are stories that are passed down orally, some of which are undoubtedly very reliable, but they don't get written down for the second, third, fourth century, some of them, some so we have to look and rely on the New Testament again for the history of the early church's expansion, just like we did uh, for Jesus. And really, in the New Testament, the, the two documents, Paul's letters kind of deal with this period, but he doesn't give us a lot of historical detail too often. He usually gives us a lot of names. We get to see some problems early churches had, but there's not a lot of historical detail he throws in for the most part. Uh, he does mention Jesus' Last Supper in First Corinthians. He does talk about the resurrection, things like that. We looked at that last week with Jesus. But really, for our purposes, for the early church's days, the, the, the two best are a little bit from Galatians, Paul's epistle, and mainly from the book of Acts. We don't have other sources to tell us about the early church's history in the O's, in the first century AD. So Galatians and Acts are the primary sources we have to draw upon here. And Galatians, Galatians was a primary source in that it was written by Paul or authored by Paul, whether he wrote it or not, he stood behind it as the author. I've, I've used this illustration before, but when a president gives a speech, none of us expect the president to have sat down and written every word of the speech. Maybe they did, you know, Lincoln wrote the Gettysburg Address in the back of an envelope, supposedly, but these days you expect that there are people that work for him that do the writing. And that's probably the case with Paul. He's got a fairly large missionary organization, but he does stand behind uh, what's being sent out. He is the author, if not the writer, of these New Testament books. And in Galatians, he does drop in some tantalizing details, especially in chapter one, chapter two, we'll look at later, that give us some autobiographical detail. Luke, of course, is writing the book of Acts, traditionally, and Luke is not Paul. So it's not a primary source, not, it's not autobiography. Well, parts of Acts may be, but we'll talk about that in a sec. Uh, Acts is written by Luke, who is probably a follower of Paul, probably a Gentile, probably a physician, perhaps a slave, which uh, seems like an oxymoron to us that a doctor would be a slave, but that was actually relatively common. Teachers and doctors were often slaves. You wanted to be able to keep tabs on them. And, uh, you know, educated slaves were a very popular thing in the Roman Empire. A lot of people couldn't write. You rely on your slaves to do your writing for you. But Luke uh, wrote Acts as a sequel. I mean, it's, it's a direct sequel. He starts out uh, the book of Acts with him. My first book, O Theophilus, uh, he's talking about the gospel of Luke. And he says, and now I'm going to tell you some more. And uh, here we go, the book of Acts of the Apostles. Uh, probably written in the late 80s. Luke was probably written in the 80s you know, somewhere, and Acts followed that. So probably mid-80s to mid-90s is kind of the normal window for looking at the, the writing of the book of Acts. 
And there are some little tiny autobiographical, we think they're autobiographical sections of Acts because Luke switches pronouns. He goes from the third person to first person, uh, plural, uh, in these little sections of Luke. Uh, Paul did this and Paul did that, and they were going off and doing that. And then they met Luke, and, and we, we got on a boat, and we went there, and uh, we went there. And then they uh, headed off down the road. And so you get these little tantalizing we sections that are autobiographical, we think, in the Acts of the Apostles, where Luke is part of the early church's movement there. Luke is also reputed to have known Mary uh, personally. And if you look at the Christmas story, it's all very centered on Mary. Matthew hardly mentions Mary. She's a bit part in Matthew. Uh, she's the center of the Christmas story in Luke. So fascinating character, Luke. I wanted to look at this map. For, we're going to use this map uh, for, I wish it was a little bit better res, but uh, we're going to use this map for several weeks because it gives us a lot of interesting information. It shows us the rough growth of the Christian church geographically. If you notice the brightest purple down here, uh, the, the most magenta magenta, the neon magenta here is the first century church. And so in the first century, we have the church planted in you know, Palestine and Syria, Roman Palestine, Judea, uh, Galilee, up into Syria here. Uh, Antioch is going to be a big center. That's in Syria, modern Syria. Uh, Eastern Turkey, what they called Asia back in the day. We think of Asia as a whole continent. They thought of it as this. This is Asia here. And uh, a little bit in Greece and southern Greece here, Macedonia and Greece, uh, Crete. And then some pockets elsewhere, pocket in Egypt, pocket in Libya, which is Cyrene, and then a pocket in Rome. And really in the first century, that's probably about the extent of Christianity geographically. And next week, we'll talk about the second century, the, the 100s. And in the 100s, it doesn't grow that much. A little bit of growth in southern Spain. Uh, Carthage becomes a Christian community. A uh, couple little enclaves in England, uh, southern France, especially Lyon. And oops. And uh, just a little bit of extension here in Asia. So the, 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 the initial footprint of Christianity is largely where Jesus was and his immediate followers. Also, these little pockets here. And then Paul's journeys account for a lot of the territory that's Christian in the first century. So Paul's a very important player as far as the, the footprint of Christianity on the map in the first century here. Questions about that before we go on? Because I am going to be coming back to that one. Yeah, Mark. Go any further south into Africa, or is that? I'm, I'm going to mention that um, there are the Ethiopian Coptic Church claims that I'll, I'll mention that in just a second. Um, the Martoma Church. Well, let's let's I'm pretty close on the slot. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Here we go. So, having spoken about that, there are stories that St. Thomas went east into Iraq, uh, eventually India. Now, whether the church really got established there or not, or, or Thomas just got bumped off there and it kind of petered out and built up later, we're not sure. But the, the Indian Christians call themselves Martoma Christians, uh, use Thomas's name still to this day. And we in the Episcopal Church are in full communion with the Martoma Church of India. In fact, we had a Martoma wedding here. Uh, the bride was Anglo, the, the groom was Indian. And... Uh, I had a, a Martoma bishop and priest and me. They split the service in thirds. They gave me a third of it. They did not tell me they were going to chant their parts. It was a weird uh, Eastern chant. I, in fact, I had the first prayer and I said my prayer. And then they're doing this weird chant. And I actually listened to this. I think, I think I could kind of pick up that cadence. And so I did. And everybody said, oh, you must have practiced. Uh, no, I, I was just making it up. But, uh, you know, I, I can sing a decent ear. So, uh, Anyway, Martoma Church, uh, they claim Thomas established him. That could be, could be factual. So, India. Uh, in Acts, in the eighth chapter of Acts, we get a story of Philip converting an Ethiopian eunuch who worked for the queen of Ethiopia, uh, the Kandake, the Candace. And so they claim that he came back and founded their church right then, and that they have first century roots. Not a lot of hard evidence for that, but could be, could be. They certainly look to this eunuch as their founder. 
Um, Cyrene, there's an early church in Cyrene. We really have no real good reason to know why it's there. Cyrene is uh, northern Libya. It's this little enclave of Libya here. Uh, and the only reason it, it may have been there uh, is that a Simon of Cyrene is mentioned in the Gospels as carrying Jesus' cross. Matthew, Mark, and Luke mentioned this guy named Simon, a Jew coming in from Cyrene for the Passover. Uh, why would they mention him by name? Well, maybe he was an important player in the early church. And one of the Gospels mentions his two sons. He was the father of Alexander and Rufus. Uh, and Paul mentions a Rufus in his epistle to the Romans, interestingly. Now, there could be a couple of Rufuses running around the early church, but it could be the same guy. And uh, also, Paul talks about Rufus and say hi to your mom, because she's, she's like a mother to me. And so it could be that Simon's wife and two sons and Simon all became important players in the early church. Certainly, there was a first century church in Cyrene, uh, and we have really no other great explanation as to how it got there. So maybe, maybe that was Simon's family that planted that. But Acts doesn't focus on any of that. Uh, and the Alexandrian church, uh, did I say that? Oh yeah, Mark. Uh, I put it on the slide, but didn't mention it. Uh, there are legends about St. Mark uh, being in Rome and then heading down to Alexandria later on and uh, helping plant the church and being a bishop of Alexandria in Northern Egypt. So we, we have these outside the book of Acts, later stories that could be, could be. Something has to explain why the church is there. But so good question, Mark. But Acts really focuses on Jerusalem to Rome, and that's, that's Acts' primary uh, purpose here. I, I put this slide up before. Uh, from a secular standpoint, uh, you know, historians, it's hard to say whether Jesus rose from the dead or not. I believe Jesus rose from the dead. I think that was a historical occurrence, but historians debate about whether that's a historical fact or not. But one thing that's very hard to explain is how the church does grow rather rapidly and expand uh, in numbers and also some geography, but especially in numbers uh, without the resurrection taking place. And so um, that's, that's an important piece of the puzzle here. And that's what we're going to be talking about. So Acts, Acts. Most Bible books have a topic sentence that kind of summarizes the book. They're often towards the beginning of the Bible. John puts his at the almost very end of his gospel in chapter 20. Uh, but Acts has a really nice summary thesis statement in verse 8 of chapter 1. Uh, it's from Jesus' lips. Jesus says, you all, you apostles, you disciples, will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is like a target, Jerusalem, and you go out, and you got Samaria to the north, and then you got, or Judea is around Jerusalem, and Samaria to the north, and then everywhere else. Uh, so it's going to ripple out from Jerusalem. In fact, Luke kind of ignores any possibility of Jesus going to Jerusalem, except when he's a kid. Uh, Acts really does kind of see things, uh, Luke sees things as focusing in on Jerusalem at the passion and resurrection, and then going out from there to all the world later on. So that's really his topic sentence. And the Holy Spirit piece is important. The Holy Spirit is a key player as far as Luke is concerned in the spread of the early Christian church. And I would say as a priest, uh, it'd be hard to explain why this movement didn't die off if God was not behind it and supporting it and all of that. But that's a faith statement, of course, not a historical statement. And Rabbi Gamaliel said, you know, let's, let's just watch it. If, it. if it's of God, we're not going to be able to stop it. If it's not of God, you know, it'll, it'll fall apart. And, you know, they knew about lots of other movements that did fall apart. So, All right. There is a problem with Acts. Acts is really bad about giving us good, explicit time clues. Uh, you have to go look at all kinds of other documents. You know, this is during the reign of such and such. Well, when was that? Oh, my gosh, that was in the 50s. Uh, so you know, if you kind of read through Acts, uh, you might think, oh, this, is, this has been a pleasant two years of the church's history. Uh, but it really turns out to be more than 30. Uh, so there's, there's a broad swath of time. You know, the Gospels cover basically a year to three years of Jesus's ministry with maybe a prequel, a prelude of his birth and all. But Acts, three decades of time. It's a much bigger uh, historical look that Acts takes. Just a quick run through of uh, what Acts is all about. So Acts begins in Jerusalem, uh, again, rippling out from there. 
And in the first part of Acts, Peter is the number one star of the book, if you want to call him that, after the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit really is a star all the way to the book of Acts. Uh, chapter one of Acts talks about the first 49 days of the church's history. Jesus is there for 40 of those, and then he ascends up into heaven. Uh, the church has to make a few decisions without Jesus, replacing Judas, etc. cetera. Uh, but then on, in chapter two, we're narrated day 50 of the church's existence, day 50 of the resurrection, Pentecost, a uh, Jewish holiday, not a Christian term originally. And the Holy Spirit comes upon uh, the, the entire group of uh, Christians there. And from that point, we start to grow as a movement. Uh, some historians take some of the numbers of the grain of salt, but in chapter one of Acts, there are 120 followers, give or take, and there are 5,000 added on the day of Pentecost, according to uh, Luke. Now, whether that's 5,000, meaning 4,999 plus one, or whether that's a whole big bunch, uh, you, could, you could argue about that, but a, a big bump uh, on the day of Pentecost in chapter two. But it keeps growing from there, but it, it stays restricted to Jerusalem. And in Acts, uh, it's, Christianity is very much a Jewish movement. Uh, the, the, the Christians go to the temple, and then they also will meet together on Sunday and have a little Christian uh, festival of breaking bread and uh, sharing fellowship and, and having Eucharist, basically, early Eucharist. So it's kind of contained in Jerusalem. Jerusalem's kind of a cradle in the book of Acts, and it's a Jewish Christian movement at that point. But the first minor crisis comes in chapter six. Uh, there's some tension, ethnic tension, because you've got these uh, Palestinian type Jews, uh, Jews from the area, and you've got these Jews that are more Hellenized that have landed in Jerusalem, and their widows are kind of being ignored by the church, and the Judean widows are being taken care of, but the, the uh, Hellenized Greek widows are not being Greek Christian. Greek Jewish Christian widows are not being taken care of. And so they say, this is a problem. Let's fix it. And so they appoint some deacons to make sure things are distributed uh, nicely for all the, the needy within the, within the church. So they, they fix that crisis. And then one of the first seven deacons is arrested in ch late chapter six and into chapter seven. And there's a long narrative of his trial. And Luke marvelously uses that as a, a chance for his Gentile readers to slip in a summary of the entire Old Testament. It's a wonderful summary of the Old Testament. If you're not a Jew, which Luke's audience was not, uh, it, it, it's, it's actually literarily brilliant. Uh, okay, let's get the whole Old Testament in here in summary form in two chapters or a chapter and a half. Uh, and Steve, they put it in the mouth of Stephen, and that's part of his defense at trial. Well, he is convicted, uh, and they do take him out to lynch him, to stone him to death. And Stephen becomes the first Christian martyr, one of his first seven deacons, the first Christian martyr. All right, so that's part one in Jerusalem. Part two uh, is kind of the hinge point of the entire book. Things shift in the three chapters of part two, chapters eight, nine, and ten. And you have kind of three, three foci, three focuses for those chapters. First chapter eight, uh, Deacon Philip, it takes the gospel out to Samaria. Uh, there's starting to be some persecution, and so it's pushing the church out, and Deacon Philip goes to Samaria and baptizes some Samaritans there, and then he baptizes uh, a real Gentile, that Ethiopian eunuch we mentioned uh, towards the end of chapter 8. Chapter 9 focuses on the chief Jewish persecutor, Saul Paulus. Uh, Saul, his Hebrew name, Paulus, his Roman name, and he has a big conversion experience on the road to Damascus. And the chief persecutor becomes the chief missionary of the church eventually. He doesn't start that day. Uh, years elapse, but uh, it will happen eventually. He has to really wrestle with. Uh, it, it's not. It's not. Oh well, I guess I've been wrong. So let's let's hit the ground running. Uh, it's I've been wrong. I need to. I need to figure out what this is all about. He takes a while to figure it out. Then in chapter ten, Peter, the number one guy in the first part of Acts, has a vision. Uh, it's of unclean animals and clean animals coming down on a sheet from heaven. And God tells him to eat it, kill and eat. Peter says, I can't eat shrimp. Uh, they're not kosher. I can't eat pork chops. They're not kosher. And God says, what I've made clean, you shouldn't refuse. So Peter takes that to mean uh, that the church is not just for those following the Jewish law, but it's going to be for all the people of the world. So these three, three things kind of focus the hinge of Acts, getting, getting us pushed out of Jerusalem a little bit. And then 
then the push really starts uh, hard. There's some persecution. That's why Paul is there doing things. Stephen has been killed in chapter seven. But, but things really start to get pushed out of, of the Jerusalem nest. The, the little baby bird of Christianity gets pushed out of the Jerusalem nest. There are still Christians in Jerusalem, but they also get dispersed into the Roman Empire. Uh, chapter 11 and 12, uh, Peter goes to the church in Jerusalem, explains his vision. Uh, in those chapters, uh, the apostle James, James, the brother of John, the son of Zebedee, not James, the brother of Jesus. Uh, he's arrested. He's executed the first of the 12 to be martyred. Uh, Peter is arrested, he kind of swept up in the same thing. They're expecting him to be killed. Uh, he is miraculously freed from jail. In fact, he shows up at the church's house and knocks on the door and the servant girl thinks he's a ghost because they expect him to be dead. Uh, oh, they, they killed him in prison. No, it's, it's really me, but uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out of Dodge and head off uh, and spread the gospel elsewhere. So Peter kind of does that. And Peter kind of fades out as the lead character in Acts at this point for the most part. And then from chapter 13 on, we really get a focus on Paul. Paul is going to be the missionary figure. Now, we've probably got about a decade here uh, between Paul going on his first missionary journey versus his conversion. So it's not something that happened immediately. But Paul has set up shop in uh, Antioch. Antioch's in Syria. We'll, we'll look at a map next week of the big cities in the Roman Empire. But Antioch is one of the, the biggest cities in the Roman Empire. It's ironic. We think of the Roman Empire as being Western Europe. Uh, barbarians in Western Europe. They're fighting people in Western Europe. You know, you got people dressing up in blue, pe blue body paint and eating wild mushrooms and fighting. Uh, the four biggest cities after Rome are in Egypt and uh, later North Africa. Well, and at that point, North Africa um, and Syria and what we would call Turkey, Ephesus. Uh, so you got Rome in the West and you got four big population centers in the Roman Empire, the next four biggest cities are all in the east. But uh, be that as it may, Paul is in one of those cities, Antioch in Syria, so up the coast from Jerusalem. And Paul heads out on these series of missionary journeys. Uh, he starts out with a Christian named Barnabas, who's part of that church, also has some Jerusalem connections. connections. Uh, and, and then they, they go out on this missionary trip. It's a small one. I'll look at the map in a second. And then they come back and say, hey, church in Jerusalem, they go down to Jerusalem, have a meeting with the James, the brother of Jesus, and the church there and say, hey, we need to be spreading the gospel to more than just Jews. Now, the good news is for Gentiles. Listen to what's happened. Listen to what God's telling us. Listen to the conversion experience these folks have had. Uh, can we start doing that? And they say, yeah, yeah. And James, uh, one of the most hyper-Jewish of the early church figures, is very strong in saying, yes, let's take the gospel to the Gentiles. And that James throwing his weight really seems to help things. So it's going to be more than just Jews. Well, Acts continues. There's another missionary journey. Uh, Paul gets all the way into Greece this time. He's not planning on going to Greece, but uh, he keeps running into roadblocks. And then there's, he has a dream that an angel says, come across the water into, into Macedonia. And so he takes the gospel there uh, and then back. And then third missionary journey kind of retraces uh, his steps and also collects this offering. He mentions the offering in several of his epistles. The Jerusalem church has fallen on hard times. Jerusalem's having apparently some kind of drought or famine. And so they're collecting money from these baby daughter churches to take back to the mother church in Jerusalem. And then while Paul's in Jerusalem doing that, he gets arrested and the case just hits roadblocks. It drags on for years and years, goes through a couple different governors. Uh, Paul eventually gets fed up and appeals to Caesar. And the governor said, man, I was about to set you free, but okay, if you want to appeal your case uh, to Caesar, you shall go. And Paul has to go to Rome to stand trial. And Acts ends with Paul under house arrest, uh, waiting for trial in Rome. We think Paul was released after that and spent a few more years doing missionary work. He wanted to go to Spain. There are thoughts he may have gone to Spain, but that's not hardcore proof. Uh, but eventually he does end back up in Rome and gets martyred there. So just to scale, I tried to get these maps to scale here. So first missionary journey is just you know, starting in Antioch, which is uh, in Syria here, and uh, heading over to Cyprus and up into Turkey and then around and back. Uh, so pretty small. And then they've gone to Jerusalem. Second missionary journey, they kind of retrace their steps by, he, Paul retraces his steps by land. Barnabas splits with him and goes back to Cyprus. They have a falling out. Uh, and Paul keeps going and eventually comes across 
and plants these churches in Greece, uh, Thessalonica, Corinth, uh, places that Philippi. We have epistles to these churches here. Uh, and then he goes back to Jerusalem and then up to Antioch again. Uh, third missionary journey starts out in Antioch, uh, kind of retraces steps, a little bit different the land and sea routes, uh, comes back and takes the offering to Jerusalem and gets arrested there. And then the fourth trip, it's really not a missionary trip per se, it's Paul under arrest, uh, being taken uh, by the Romans, and there's a storm at sea, very dramatic, all kinds of stuff, but he eventually makes it to Rome. Now, part of what Luke is trying to show us here is that the church has gone to the ends of the earth. Actually, it's gone from the fringes to the center of the empire. It started in Jerusalem at the edge of the empire. It's in Rome, the heart of the empire. Uh, and that's where Luke drops the mic. He doesn't need to say later on what happens to Paul. Uh, he probably figures people know that, that Paul was martyred. We'll talk about that in a moment here. Okay, Paul in the book of Acts has a typical strategy. Um, Acts 14 is exemplary of it, but you can see it in lots of places. Paul's basic strategy, he would enter a new city. He'd visit the Jewish synagogue there because there's almost always a group of Jews in those bigger towns. And he would stay and preach in the synagogue saying, Jesus is the true Messiah. He's uh, the hope of Israel. And he'd keep preaching that until he got kicked out. Uh, so I said, eh, you know, you, this, is, this is too kooky, out. And so he'd set up shop somewhere else in town, sometimes by a river, uh, but, you know, maybe in somebody's house. Uh, and he preached there until the town fathers kicked him out. Sometimes they'd beat him uh, and kick him out. Uh, and then he'd head to the next city and start the pattern over again. So Paul very much is instrumental in that spread of Christianity over Turkey and into Greece. Uh, he's not single-handedly doing it. He's got an entourage, a posse. We think his group may be... 40, maybe even 50 uh, of his fellow workers. He names a bunch of them. If you ever wonder in the ep epistles while Paul names so many people, well, they're part of his, his big missionary group. And so, uh, but he's not a lone ranger by any means, but he is instrumental in spreading the church in this area. Okay, just a couple things from Galatians, because they kind of supplement the book of Acts. And Galatians is written 30 years before Acts, and it's written under Paul's direct supervision instead of 20 years after Paul's death. Uh, it's interesting, Galatians chapter 1, Paul talks about his conversion very personally and uh, says that he went off to Arabia and just wrestled with it, basically. And uh, after three years of wrestling, went to Jerusalem to meet with some of the original apostles. He only met with Peter. He stayed in Peter's house for a couple weeks. And the only other guy he saw was James, the brother of Jesus, uh, during that time. But, you know, when Paul talks later about uh, what was handed on to him, he's probably referring to these encounters with the original group of disciples uh, early on. So three years uh, between Paul uh, initially being converted and even getting to Jerusalem to talk to Peter and James. And then later there in Galatians 2, the next chapter, there's a personal account of Paul defending his uh, missionary pursuits of the Gentiles, his conversions of the Gentiles. And it looks like Acts may have airbrushed things and kind of uh, you know, eased, uh, leveled out the controversy a little bit. In Galatians, it seems a little more sharper, but it still comes to the same conclusion uh, in the book of Acts. And Paul is authorized to take. Uh, so the, 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 the Bottom line in Acts and the bottom line in Galatians are the same. It seems a little, a little more pointed from Paul's perspective in Galatians, but they do say that Christianity be, can be taken out to Gentiles. Uh, and Paul says, that gives us a time clue, Paul says this was 14 years after his first visit to Peter, so 17 years after his conversion. So we rely on some of these time clues to help us with, with that. Uh, later New Testament writer, later writers, not New Testament writers, uh, tell us about Peter and Paul's martyrdoms, they both die in Rome probably about the same time, probably in 64, though a few historians push it a little further down. Uh, Peter famously is crucified upside down, and Paul is beheaded. And the fact that the two most important disciples both die in Rome, both about the same time, helps lift Rome's prestige as kind of an important center. It's not only the capital of the empire, but we had the two most important apostles die here. And so maybe, maybe we have a little more of a role to play. Uh, we'll see that uh, causing historical issues later in the church's history. But, uh, you know, they, they, they're already starting to think, hmm, maybe we're 
a, a little better just because we've had these two apostles die there. Uh, as the story goes, Peter, this is a later story, but could be accurate. Uh, during Nero's persecution, Peter is hustled out of town by the rest of the church. He's walking away from Rome, and he has a vision of Jesus walking back in. Uh, and there's a you know, wonderful movie, uh, Quo Vadis, that has this at the end here. You know, Peter, only Peter sees it in the movie. They don't show Jesus, which is kind of it's a good way to film it. But um, Peter says, Quo Vadis Domine, where are you going, Lord? And Jesus says, I'm going back to Rome to be crucified. And Peter says, dang, okay, I denied him once. Uh, maybe I shouldn't run. Even though I'm an old man, maybe I shouldn't run. And Peter turns around and is swept up and executed. He is crucified uh, on, in a place called the Vatican Hill, uh, which is why they later built a church there. Uh, and uh, he has to be crucified upside down because he has to regard himself as worthy. So he probably expired a lot more quickly than Jesus because of that. That'd be a horrible position to be crucified in. But he asked, asked that. Uh, supposedly that was granted. And the Roman soldiers would probably be happy. And the Roman soldiers, oh, yeah, fine. Fine, dude. You want to do that? They'd give us a little, yeah, something different, a little variety, a little novelty. That's great for us. Yeah. So Paul, on the other hand, was a Roman citizen. So crucifixion was for slaves and, uh, you know, lowly foreigners. Uh, Roman citizens deserved a quick, clean death. And so Paul was beheaded in Rome about the same time. Uh, kind of a gross painting there, but if you look, Paul's head actually is supposed to have bounced three times, and made three fountains uh, in Rome. Uh, there's this legend about the bouncing head of St. Paul. And, and you can actually see various, even there's even a 19th century painting of, of that. You know, it's kind of a little water seeping up and all. But anyway, uh, Paul is beheaded as a Roman citizen uh, about this same time. So both Peter and Paul uh, died at that point. This also seems to be, there's no direct proof of this, but this also seems to be kind of an impetus for the early church. We're losing the original 12. We've lost Peter and Paul. We've lost James in Jerusalem in this same decade, uh, early 60s. He was martyred in Jerusalem. Um, we're, we're losing this group. And so it's interesting. There are no gospels before their deaths. But within a, a few years, decade, or five, six, seven, eight years after their deaths, we've got gospels starting to be written. Uh, the earliest is Mark. Mark, traditionally, is thought to be Peter's testimony. Mark was a disciple of Paul, who later became a disciple of Peter, who later became a disciple of Paul, who later may have founded the church in Alexandria or helped uh, grow it. Anyway, Mark's, Mark is supposedly giving Peter's testimony after Peter is gone. Uh, Matthew and Luke, about a decade after that. John, about another decade after that. Uh, but the, the church is saying, okay, we, we've lost this original layer of witnesses. We need to get their stuff down uh, while it's still in our fresh memory here before, you know, too much time elapses. So that seems to be what's going on. And they also seem to be collecting and preserving Paul's letters at this point. And so it's kind of an impetus for that. All right. So first century church, uh, really Paul's area is huge. Where Paul was is a huge chunk of uh, the territory of the early church here. And even in the second century, it doesn't grow much except in these areas. It grows numerically, but not geographically much in the second century. Uh, expands a lot numerically, but we'll talk about that in the next century, which is next week. Uh, any, any questions or thoughts? We'll, we'll pause there real quick. And uh, yeah. I was reading you on page 16 of the book, uh -huh. the Jerusalem Christians, and uh, talked about that last sentence that it's probably largely through the witness of these unknown Jewish converts from the earliest days that Christian faith spread throughout the empire and beyond. In the first few decades, though Acts reveals little about this. And I was thinking, what happened to those 5,000 converts right. at Pentecost? They were all from a different country. So they were all from different areas of the Roman Even Empire. They came back to Jerusalem. They still went out to their countries and they were both their Christians. That's a good, that's a good point. And again, the operative word there is probably. I mean, we don't have any direct evidence of that, but it's a very, it's a very likely scenario that they yeah. and uh, you know, there was a church in Rome before Paul wrote the epistle of the Romans. Uh, somebody got Christianity there. We don't know who. Uh, Paul went there eventually. Uh, Peter ended up there uh, eventually too, but some Jewish Christians being kicked out of Rome and probably even meets them in Greece. Uh, so, I mean, it's it's there fairly early on, and we're not sure exactly how it got there. And so, 
to me, it's a, in it, a testimony that we, we focus on missionaries. Let's pay missionaries to go evangelize. When in reality, probably the, the whole Roman world was won by people like us living their lives and becoming Christians and affecting the people around them, their neighbors, whoever. I'm, I'm showing a book to the camera. Um, I'm going to be talking about this book a lot in the next few weeks because uh, Rodney Stark does the sociological uh, great study of the early church's history. We don't have, you know, he, he uses a, as much data as we can and applies modern sociological techniques. And that's one of his key theses, theses uh, that it really was friend to friend, neighbor to neighbor, uh, family member to family member that really spread things. And the fact that the Christians live very differently than other people in their culture uh, that made it expand. So, yeah. yes. Slave, uh, free, Jew, you know, barbarian, city, right. and slave. You know, they, they were all one. They were all one. And there were some growing pains with that. You know, yeah. the, the rich would start the, the Eucharist first while the poor were still working and then you know, be drunk. By, you know, and Paul pushes back on that early on. But, you know, there are some growing pains, but it is the only group it's the only group that had table fellowship. You never would eat with anybody outside your small social strata. Uh, never. And the Christians did. Uh, remarkable. And then we'll talk about some other things too. But, but yes, Rick, real quick. There's some Roman writings about describing what these Christians do. They take care of their poor and their widows and stuff. Yeah. And like they're, what's the word for that? But somebody's reporting on. The Roman, you know, there's some even even for those who are opposing Christianity, some grudging respect. Well, they're a bunch of kooks and lunatics, but at least you can say this about them: they are good about caring for each other and loving each other. Uh, of course, they're also having orgies and they're also eating babies and they're also yeah. drinking yeah. blood. But you know, uh, but at least they're caring for each other while they're doing these kooky things. So the Romans would like the orgy stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. The, the, the Romans, the Romans actually were a little more conservative uh, outwardly in some ways. They they kind of would wink at things. Uh, but anyway, that's another another topic. Yeah, Mark. Uh, which city was it? I think it's in Acts that uh, Paul goes and they say, "Yeah, we uh, believe in Jesus," but he's like, "Have you received the Holy Spirit?" And then he says, "Which city was that?" It's somewhere. It's somewhere in Asia Minor. I I forget exactly. I have to look it up. But yeah, we're we're not having heard there is a Holy Spirit. Uh, what baptism? What was John the Baptist baptism? Oh, well. Is there uh, too? I'm sorry? Is there a Paulus tied up in that? Paulus may have been part of that. That's a good question, Jimmy. But that's often, that, that's sometimes called the Gentile Pentecost because there is a narration of the Holy Spirit coming upon them uh, when Paul and the group lay hands on them. And so uh, I think it's Paul and Barnabas. I think it's that first missionary trip, but I uh, have to double check that. And somebody must have, you know, come, went to wherever they were. Right, the right. And the fact that John the Baptist followers have gotten that far up into, I mean, there's, there's, you know, why would the Gospels put that John the Baptist baptized Jesus, uh, superiors baptized inferiors, and yet the church claims Jesus is superior to everything. Well, the only reason you'd put that in there is if it really happened, because uh, uh, people up, people apparently knew who John the Baptist was, and the, you know, his, his fame had gotten out there some, and he had followers and disciples in the Gospels. So that's a fascinating piece too. You know, we, we think of, uh, because they didn't have the internet, uh, the, you know, things moved slowly, but things still moved. And the Roman Empire, uh, talk about this next time, but the Roman Empire was really amazing, amazingly high tech and being able to communicate and being able to move troops and being able to move goods and commerce. Uh, you know, it, it might take months, it might take, you might have to wait from, uh, you know, October to March, you don't want to go by sea because it's too stormy in the Mediterranean, but, you know, things do move and information moves and stuff, like Pliny said, uh, in the 100s, everything ends up in Rome. All the craziness from around the empire eventually makes it to Rome. So, all right, we better stop it, stop it there. And next time we'll pick up starting at 8, at 9.20, 9.20 next time. Jimmy, I'll let you close that out. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm wonderful. It's so good to see you.